I'd like to invite on stage Dr. Arvind Anand Narayanan. I would be setting a brief preamble on the aerospace sector so that uh, Mr. Rajnikant Balram and uh, Mr. Pavan Ranga along with Aniket can take the stage in the panel discussion to take matters forward. So the aerospace sector is relatively new in India. We have heard all about this sector in the news. Boeing is coming to India, Collins, Pratt & Whitney, GE, you name it, everyone is looking at India, especially after 2020. 2020 was a tragic time. It was COVID. Supply chains were broken and everyone, including industry leaders in the aerospace sector, thought that this is the end. The recovery of traffic on the passenger side, the recovery of traffic on the cargo side has been truly epic after that. Cargo traffic by the time of 2023 had recovered to 2018 levels, passenger traffic likewise. And air travel has picked up rapidly once uh, the restrictions were removed. However, there were some changes. The time of COVID was used to retire older aircraft. Airline fleets became more homogenous. For example, very young airframes like uh, Air France's A380 went to the boneyard, torn up for spares ignominiously. And a lot of airlines have started replacing previous wide bodies or narrow bodies like the 757 with the rather uncomfortable but very economical A321 LR and XLR. If you're an airline executive, you love them. If you're a passenger, mm, depends. Nevertheless, Boeing is licking, licking their wounds. 737 MAX 10 is still awaiting certification, but they want to get on top of their supply chain issues as well. How have the airlines responded in this period? Airlines, of course, have been trying to increase their uh, available seat kilometers, and they've increased it by approximately 9%, even from 23 to 24. Most of this increase has come in the Asia-Pacific region. It has also come in uh, the European uh, region of operations. Fleet increases have only been to the tune of 6%. But overall, aircraft utilizations have gone up by 13%. Even older planes, which should have already been pensioned off, are being repurposed and put back into service. MRO operations are in demand, and orders for new aircraft are piling up. Now, if you look at airline fleet trends, of course, in terms of demand projections, these have increased from uh, even last year, if one were to look at what even the major airframe manufacturers have been speaking about. Even compared to 2023, between Airbus and Boeing, a total of 1,300 to 1,500 aircraft order projections have increased. Uh, at present manufacturing tempo, this would mean something anywhere from a year and a half to three years of a production backlog. Already when these manufacturers are sitting on a decade-long backlog, in the narrow body segment. To understand where the pain lies, we should perhaps step back and take a look at the aerospace value chain itself. The demand originates, of course, from the airplane operators. They could be either the airlines themselves, passenger or cargo, or from the large lessers, such as Aircap, which recently gave up a lot of its fleet to Russia when Aeroflot refused to return them their airplanes after the war in Russia. They normally influence the design of aircraft through the manufacturers and to the engine suppliers in turn. The era of engines being commodities where each airplane would have a choice of a Pratt and Whitney or a GE or a Rolls-Royce engine is now gone. The engines are a very integral part of the fuel burn of any aircraft and as a result, uh, the engine is decided with the aircraft right at design. It is therefore fair to say that the engine and the aircraft manufacturers are both OEMs. They are then supported by a network of systems integrators, sub-assembly manufacturers, component manufacturers, and materials and processes. These suppliers originated in the United States and in Europe, growing with the aircraft ecosystem as they developed there. The lead times required to create new suppliers is long. And once uh, a supplier is embedded with this ecosystem, longevity is fairly ensured. 
the problem is of course getting entrenched, that takes time. And it's a game of IPs as well. Unlike the automotive industry where models become obsolete every eight years, uh, I give an example, the GE CF6 is an engine that was manufactured and ran for the first time as the CF6-50 in the late 1960s. This engine is still around, both powering freighters, airplanes, and as a maritime derivative and as a power derivative, namely the LM2500 series of engines. Let us now step back and also look at the perfect storm of deliveries. As the COVID pandemic rolled in and left the wreckage of the supply chains in its wake, most manufacturers, Boeing and Airbus included, claimed that they could get back to full production by 2024, 2025. However, uh, in 2024, in fact, deliveries fell compared to 2023. It seems it's two steps forward, one step backward for the airplane industry itself. Uh, the machinist strike is well known. What Boeing have done to their goodwill and their capabilities is equally well known. I will not uh, spend much time on that. But even with this reduction in deliveries, the engine suppliers, namely GE and Pratt and & Whitney, especially for narrow bodies, are barely keeping up with even this reduced demand. Aircraft backlogs are piling up. Narrow body uh, backlogs for Airbus stand at 12 years. Narrow body backlogs for Boeing is unknown because they're restricted to making only 35 737s every month. White body backlogs across Airbus and Boeing stand at more than seven years, and nobody knows when they will be upping their freighters anymore because they're prioritizing the passenger demand first, which means a lot of older white bodies will get converted to freighters now. Of course, with a lot of ducting, tubing, MRO operations required for it, which I'm sure our August panel will touch upon as part of their discussions. So this broken supply chain uh, is highlighted on this slide. The OEMs, of course, are facing regulations. Boeing is saying that they will improve quality. As far as Boeing is concerned, if the doors don't fall off, it's an improvement in quality. They are in that kind of a state at the moment. Then there are competitive forces. This is an industry of duopolies. Neither one wants to vacate the battleground to the other. Aircraft and engines especially are becoming very complex. For example, if I said 30 years ago, rotor Boeing would be an issue, people would say that, oh, are you putting a big military engine on this airplane? Now, rotor Boeing is a reality for every single major engine. So uh, startup motoring procedures are significantly more complex. And if you don't do it properly, your fan blades will touch the casing tips, more MRO requirements. They are new products, and there is high demand for them. Now, the suppliers, on the other hand, the traditional ecosystem based out of Europe and America, are suffering from an aging workforce. Many of them are now second-generation businesses with succession issues, which I'm sure, again, we will have in the discussions. And, uh, more than cost competitiveness, they cannot keep up with this demand. So there is a value migration to India. The advantages of India already uh, we touched upon even in the solar discussion. I will not uh, go too deep into it, except that we have a skilled workforce. Government support is forthcoming. And uh, the capital markets are supportive. There are listed players. There are unlisted players as well. And raising capital for both working capital needs and for capex is possible. Also, there is a new industry which could come up, which would be for aftermarket parts, because India will end up with over a thousand aircraft, at least between these two operators, assuming SpiceJet continues to stay in business also. Therefore, the post-COVID aviation recovery, which has stretched supply chains, broken them at some points, has been a force of creative destruction for the Indian aerospace sector. The reorientation of these supply chains is an opportunity for the Indian aerospace sector to rise to the fore. Before passing from this slide, I will mention that to an extent, these are very IP-sensitive industries, and a lot of this engine technology can be repurposed for military use. As the dictator said, it can be used for peaceful purposes. And therefore, people are very afraid to go to China with this. I'll just uh, quickly go through this. There are uh, three major segments, aerostructures. Uh, then there is a 
engines and avionics. So the aerostructures are the largest part of the value chain. It's a close to a $500 billion industry, growing relatively at a stable rate of 3 4% a year. And here you have the big OEMs at the top. Then a variety of these players you see on the slide, like an Eaton, Liebherr, Moog, Parker, Hannafin, etc., who supply specific components which are integrated onto the airframe. For example, Liebherr supplies landing gears. It's a very niche area, very specific area of operation, and they're experts at that. Eaton and Parker Hannafin, for example, supply thermal management solutions. They have flexible connectors, hoses, various other things. And all of these, they've actually started with these manufacturers, often as military participants in contracts in the good old days of the 1960s in America and expanded from there. This is a good ecosystem to be in, but at the same time, there is more competition here because an Indian uh, player cannot directly address the large OEMs very easily. The route lies through these large entities, uh, these tier twos to the OEMs, who are very large companies in their own right. The next area that we look at is engines or propulsion. This includes both the turbo machinery on the underwing and in the tail, the APU as well. Very narrow market, very few suppliers. This is because these are extremely failure critical items. They operate at hellish temperatures. Just as an example, the uh, fan blades or the airfoil sections in the hot section of an engine are no bigger than my thumbnail and they cost more than a car. And if it fails, you'll get a hot end failure which will cause the engine to catch fire. So uh, they're very critical parts, needless to say. And because it is so critical and there is a lot of IP invested in it, uh, this is a very ring-fenced part of the ecosystem. Engine makers would directly deal with airfoil sec uh, section providers or uh, in terms of MRO operations, they have this system of licenses, which of course we'll discuss in the panel discussion perhaps, who ring fence the ecosystem and create high entry barriers with deep protected profit pools, which are of great interest for us as investors. Finally, this is a section where airplanes will see two to three sets of engines every over their lifetime. Probably now we may see more because a lot of these old airframes are still going to hang around as replacements don't come online in time. Uh, avionics, I will not touch upon very significantly because this is a relatively smaller area, 60 odd billion dollars a year. Some Indian companies are moving into it, but the uh, OEMs have an established and highly stable market for this in Europe and America for the moment. This is also an area that has significant FAA oversight. So this is like, uh, we'll get there, but not today. MRO demand, of course, is rising, as I just said. One needs to just look at Bangalore Airport. A lot of go-air have become gone-air or lying over there. Engines off the wing. Uh, Pratt & Whitney is to blame, kind of, because at a critical moment, those engines were not available. Nevertheless, engine MRO is not something which is significant in India. Currently, we send these out. But with the large number of airframes here, we will, of course, require uh, substantially more MRO capabilities in India itself. And once again, these value chains can migrate here. Uh, very rapidly, with the last one minute, I would say that uh, this is a sector where disruptions don't really take place. Eaton, Moog, Parker, Hannafin, these are snapshots over the decades. Steady revenue growth, uh, protected profit pools, and presently 30-50% approximately of their revenue still comes from the aerospace sector. Moog, for example, started with uh, motion control and servos. They also build those servo actuators on the wingtips and speed brakes of the B2 and B21 bombers and the servo actuators for that roof on the center court of Wimbledon as well. Airframe manufacturers, OEMs have come and gone. We can discuss it over tea if, if anyone is interested. But these suppliers have remained. They, have, they are now supplying to Airbus and Boeing. They used to supply to Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, and Lockheed way back in the past. This is a sector that has not been disrupted. We like in investments to speak of probabilities. So once entrenched here, the probability of reaping a high quality profit pool is fairly good. So the key takeaways are of course that we are in the sweet spot. Thank you for the bell. Uh, the values of aircraft, etc., are increasing. And even in spite of all of that, the full pushback of production normalization is back now down to 2027 at least. 
If you trust what Air India CEO said, it might be even 2032. So uh, the shifting of supply chains and the pain caused by COVID is an opportunity for the Indian aerospace sector. With this, I would like to uh, call Paolomi back on stage to introduce our panel and thank everybody for their attention. This is the culmination of eight to 10 years of work with Aniket across aerospace and defense. So thank you, everybody.